Chapter 10. Several years after the war, I read Rear Admiral Samuel Eliot Morrison's heralded historical volumes, The History of United States Naval Operations in World War II. Morrison once again shows himself to be an eloquent historian, and in his work has provided voluminous documentation. It is regrettable, then, that a specific portion of this war history has little basis, in fact. I refer to the campaign which won for us the Dutch East Indies, especially the major bastion of Java. It is the Admiral's own opinion that, where this campaign is concerned, our victories were of stealth and of strength rather than skill. Particular attention is given to the defeat of the Dutch and Allied fleets in February of 1942. Here not only Morrison but other equally renowned American historians have all neglected to include in their documented reports details of the greatest air battle staged in the entire Pacific up to that time. As a mere non-commissioned pilot in that fray, my perspective is of course much more confined than that of the writer who encompasses the entire vast war. However, my personal account of part of that February campaign may prove enlightening to the student of the Pacific War. The Java campaign was virtually ended on February 26th, with the defeat by Japanese warships of the Allied surface forces in the area. A major factor contributing to that defeat was the lack of air cover, which the Allied ships required so desperately. But nowhere in the American versions of the war have I read that the Allies' air units were destroyed on February 19, in a wild air melee over Surabaya, when a total of nearly 75 fighter planes of both combatants fought their biggest air duel of the war to date. It was this fighter versus fighter air victory, and not raids by our bombers against enemy airfields which denied the Allied warships their air cover, and contributed so completely to their destruction. On February 4, 1942, I flew to the Balik Papan airfield with several other Zero pilots. The next day we established new combat patrols in the area. Action was brisk, since enemy air activity was heavy and aggressive. Official Japanese records credit me with a victory on the 5th, when we fought a series of running air battles. The next week, our reconnaissance planes brought back reports that the enemy had concentrated in the Surabaya area a total of 50 to 60 fighter planes, Curtis P-36 Mohawks, Curtis P-40 Tomahawks, and Brewster F-2A Buffaloes, which were to resist our invasion of Java. Our high command ordered all available land-based fighter planes in the theater to concentrate at newly captured Balikpapan. On the morning of February 19th, 23 Zero fighters, assembled from the Tainan and Kaohsiung units, took off for Surabaya. This was the first occasion on which we knew we would encounter heavy enemy fighter opposition. Before us was a 430-mile flight to the Dutch Bastion, where there awaited a numerically superior force. No one expected to breeze through another victory, as we had done in the Philippines. Every possible precaution was taken to aid our flight. Special ditching islands were assigned all pilots, where naval units awaited those planes which might be forced down. Weather planes preceded our flight to give constant readings, and a fast reconnaissance plane acted as a pathfinder and warning scout for our Zeros. We reached Surabaya at 11.30 a.m., flying at 16,000 feet. The enemy force anticipating our arrival was unprecedented. At least 50 Allied fighters flying at about 10,000 feet, maintained a large counterclockwise sweep over the city. The enemy planes extended in a long line, composed of three waves of V-groups which outnumbered us by more than two to one. Upon sighting the enemy fighters, we jettisoned our tanks and climbed for altitude. Sighting our force, the Allied fighters broke off their circular movement and at full speed closed toward us. They were prepared and eager for a fight unlike the American fighters we had encountered over Clark Field on December 8th. Less than a minute later, the orderly formations disintegrated into a wild, swirling dogfight. I watched a P-36 scream toward me, then flicked into a swift left roll, waiting for the enemy's reaction. Foolishly, he maintained his course. That was all for me, and I snapped around into a sharp right turn, standing the zero on her wing, and came out directly on the tail of the startled P-36 pilot. A look behind me showed my own plane clear, and I closed the distance to the enemy fighter. He rolled to the right, but slight control movements kept the Zero glued to his tail. 
Fifty yards away, I opened up with the guns and cannon. Almost immediately, the right wing broke off and snapped away in the airstream. Then the left wing tore loose. Spinning wildly, the P-36 broke up into wreckage as it plummeted. The pilot failed to get out. Swinging into a wide, climbing turn, I headed back for the main flight. At least six planes were falling in flames. Fighters swirled crazily about in the air, and abruptly the olive drab of a P-36 rolled toward my own fighter. I turned to meet his rush, but in the next moment another Zero whipped upward in a steep climb, caught the P-36 in a long cannon burst, then snapped away as the Dutch plane exploded. To my left, a P-40 closed in on the tail of a fleeing Zero, and I turned desperately to draw the enemy fighter off. There was no need to do so. The Zero whipped up and around in a tight loop that ended exactly above and behind the P-40. The guns and cannon hammered, and the P-40 burst into flames. Another P-40 flashed by, trailing a streamer of flame fully three times as long as the fighter. A P-36 flipped crazily through the air, its pilot dead at the controls. Below me, our unarmed Pathfinder plane flashed by, caught by three Dutch fighters. The Japanese pilot was corkscrewing violently to evade the enemy tracers which flashed all about his plane. Again, I arrived too late. A Zero plummeted down in a power dive, and his cannon shells exploded the top Dutch fighter's fuel tanks. Pulling out of the dive, the Zero flashed upward in a steep zoom, catching the second P-36 from beneath. It fell off on one wing even as the third pilot whipped around to meet the Zero. Too late, his cockpit erupted in a shower of glass. The other Zero pulled alongside my plane, the pilot waving and grinning broadly then dropped away as he escorted the reconnaissance plane out of the area. A P-36, apparently fleeing the fight, passed over me. I slammed the throttle on overboost and yanked the stick back, looping to come out close to the Dutchman. Still climbing, I opened up with the cannon. Too soon. The pressure of the turn threw my aim off. The cannon gave me away. The P-36 jerked hard over in a left roll and dove vertically for the ground. I cut inside his turn and went into a dive as the Curtis flashed by less than 50 yards away. My finger snapped down on the button and the shells exploded in the fuselage. Thick black smoke belched back. I fired two more bursts, then pulled it out as a sheet of flame enveloped the Dutch fighter. A Zero with two blue stripes across the fuselage passed 200 yards in front of my plane. Without warning, the Zero exploded in a vivid blast of fire killing Lieutenant Masao Asai, our squadron commander. To this day, I do not know what caused the explosion. Back at 8,000 feet, I noticed about 20 Zero fighters circling in formation. The few surviving Dutch fighters were black specks disappearing in the distance. The battle was over, six minutes after it had started. Strangely, with the air cleared of their own planes, the Dutch anti-aircraft batteries remained silent as we circled over the city waiting for any other Zeros that might have left in pursuit of the escaping Dutch fighters. While the other fighters circled, I passed over the narrow waterway separating Surabaya from Madura Island. There was a well-camouflaged airstrip there. I descended slowly, marking on my map the location of the airstrip, near Jigjungbang, on the western tip of Madura. We had no reports of the existence of this secret airfield, and the information would be well received by intelligence. I began my climb back to rendezvous with the other fighters when a single P-36 passed beneath me, low over the city. It was too good a target to miss. The enemy pilot flew leisurely at cruising speed, unaware of my approach. My eagerness lost me a quick victory. Too far away for effective fire, I squeezed the cannon trigger. That was all the warning the Dutchman needed, and he nosed down suddenly, fleeing with all his speed. Cursing my own stupidity, I slammed the throttle home and shoved the stick forward to follow the P-36. But I had afforded the enemy pilot a priceless advantage. The flight performance of the P-36 was considerably below that of our own fighters. The Zeros were faster, had superior maneuverability, armament, rate of roll and climb. But the Zero was never designed for high-speed dives, and my premature burst enabled the P-36 to extend the distance between our two planes to 200 yards. I could get no closer. The enemy pilot could have made good his escape had he begun his dive at a greater height.
but the uprushing ground forced him to pull out into level flight. Now I could use the zero superior speed to advantage. The Dutchman hedge-hopped and zigzagged frantically. Every time he turned, I cut inside his turn, narrowing the distance between our two planes. He flew lower and lower in a desperate attempt to escape, barely clearing trees and houses, hoping to elude me until a shortage of fuel would cause me to break off the attack. And I was close to that mark. In a final bid for speed, I pushed the engine on overboost even as the Malung Air Base came into sight. Fifty yards away, I concentrated on the P-36 cockpit and squeezed the trigger. The cannon were empty, but two streams of machine gun bullets tore the pilot apart. The fighter crashed into a rice paddy and flipped over on its back. I was the last pilot to rejoin the other fighters, circling at 13,000 feet 20 miles north of Madura. We had lost Lieutenant Asai and two other pilots. Back at Balik Papan, the pilots claimed a total of 40 enemy fighters shot down and probably destroyed. I have always been inclined to discount by 20 or 30 percent the claims of any group of pilots after a wild battle such as we had fought over Surabaya. In the confusion of a dogfight, two or three pilots shoot at the same enemy plane and each will claim that fighter for his own. This time, however, it appeared that there was little exaggeration in our claims, for from that day on, we met practically no opposition from Dutch fighters. There was more good fortune. Intelligence officers sent out a bombing group to attack the secret airbase at Jembang, and the unexpected bombing destroyed most of the remaining enemy planes, P-40s, Buffaloes, and British Hurricanes, on the ground. We returned the next day to Java to attack any fighters encountered in the air and to strafe available targets on the ground. The enemy anti-aircraft which had remained silent the day before now opened up with a vengeance and we lost three of our 18 zeros. Each night we heard allied claims of five or six zero fighters shot down in battle by the enemy during the day. It was remarkable, considering that our group flew the only zeros in the area and that our greatest casualties occurred on February 19th and 20, with six planes and pilots lost. On the 25th 18, Zeros left Balikpapan with orders to mop up the Malang Air Base, where intelligence believed the enemy was servicing several Allied bombers staging a last-ditch defence of the islands. En route to Malang, we encountered a Dutch float plane, and I broke formation long enough to send him crashing into the ocean. If the Dutch had any fighters left at Malang, they refused to do battle. After circling the field for six minutes, our flight leader led us down to strafe three B-17s on the field. Anti-aircraft fire was intense, but we saw all three bombers exploding in flame. The Dutch ground gunners holed several fighters, but failed to bring down any zeros. My next kill, officially my 13th, came on the last day of February. I flew as part of the escort of 12 fighters, shepherding 12 Betty bombers from Makassar to attack the Allied forced evacuation of Chilatjap. The enemy ships had cleared the harbour before our arrival, and the fighters cruised slowly while the bombers dumped their missiles into the port installations. The attack was uneventful for us, and after escorting the bombers back to the Java Sea, we turned toward Malang in search of enemy planes. Luck was with us today. Four fighters, of a type we had not yet encountered, circled in the air near a tremendous cumulonimbus cloud which towered to 25,000 feet. As we approached, we identified the enemy planes as Dutch buffaloes. I have never understood the lack of caution on the part of these Dutch pilots. Even before they knew we were in the vicinity, we closed in and one zero set a buffalo blazing with a long burst. I rushed the second fighter, which whipped around in a tight turn. He was willing enough to fight. I cut easily inside the buffalo's turn, heeling over in a vertical bank and coming out of the turn 200 yards from the enemy plane. I rarely fired when still in a turn, but this time I jabbed impatiently on the button. Several bullets hit the buffalo's engine and smoke burst back from the plane. It seemed as if the pilot had also been hit, for the Brewster went into a series of repeated slow rolls until it disappeared into the cloud. It appeared impossible for the crippled fighter to survive the violent thermal inside the cloud, but, as I did not actually see the plane crash, I was credited only with a probable. For the next several months we moved from one airbase to another. We returned to the Philippines and flew support missions for the army 
as they wore Corregidor's defences to the breaking point. Then our unit transferred south to Bali Island in Indonesia to prepare for the next major operation to the south. I've never understood the American versions of the aerial combats of those days. Especially astonishing was a report by Lieutenant Colonel Jack D. Dale, who claimed that his P-40 squadron shot down 71 Japanese aircraft with a loss of only nine P-40 pilots in 45 days of fighting in Java. This is an incredible figure, as our actual losses were less than 10 zeros in combat during this period. According to Dale, his P-40 pilots used a split-S maneuver, descending 6,000 to 8,000 feet when encountering zeros and then returning to fighting position. He claimed that in this fashion, he could make his 16 fighters appear as 48. In all my combat with American P-40 fighters, I never once encountered this maneuver as described by Colonel Dale. Especially against the P-40, a fighter plane markedly inferior in performance to the Zero, my own group invariably terminated combat in a heavy victory for our own pilots. Also confusing is Dale's report that one night we heard Radio Tokyo say hundreds of P-40s were attacking out of nowhere. They are a new type of Curtis, armed with six cannon. Katsutaro Kamiya, who at the time was in charge of Radio Tokyo's shortwave English broadcasts, told me that there was never any such broadcast, as quoted by the American colonel. There was little need for such statements, Kamiya added, for then we had nothing to report but victories. Colonel Dale's reports of air victories held as little truth as did the sinking of the Haruna by Captain Kelly. Chapter 11 In early March of 1942, the 150 pilots of the Tainan fighter wing, who had been scattered over a wide area of the Philippines and Indonesia, reassembled in Bali Island in the East Indies. The complete occupation of Indonesia itself appeared imminent. One company of Japanese army troops constituted the entire military occupation force of the island. Occupation is a misleading term, for our forces found the Bali natives friendly to the Japanese. Bali seemed like a paradise. The weather was perfect and the local scenery the most colourful and beautiful I have ever seen anywhere in the Pacific. Lush vegetation grew around our airfield, and we delighted in the hot springs which bubbled from the rocks. Since we were grounded for a while, we turned, at least for the moment, to more personal pleasures. One afternoon we were lounging inside our club, when we were startled by the sound of a heavy bomber approaching the field. One pilot ran to the window, then jerked his head back, his eyes wide, Hey, B-17, and it's coming down. We ran to the window, crowding for a look. There it was, the impossible, a giant flying fortress, its landing gear and flaps extended, engines throttled back, easing out of its approach path for a landing. I rubbed my eyes. This just couldn't be true. Where could the plane have come from? But there it was, bouncing slightly as the wheels hit the earth. The squeal of brakes came to our ears. In a moment, we were rushing through the door, excited with the prospect of being able to study in detail the defences of the powerful American bomber. That ship out there could only be a plane we had captured. The roar of machine guns brought us up short. Someone pointed. The army troops. The B-17 wasn't captured. Its pilot had landed in error at our field, and some idiotic soldier was firing at him even before the plane stopped rolling. Hardly had the machine gun spit out a dozen rounds when the bursting roar of four engines suddenly rammed to full power thundered over the field. The B-17 raced down the runway, streaming dust behind, as its pilot fought the plane into the air. And then it was gone. We were stunned. A B-17, intact, right in our hands, and the priceless opportunity had been thrown away by some trigger-happy baboon of a machine gunner. In a group, we ran to the army revetments. Several of the pilots could barely restrain themselves. One non-commissioned officer lost his temper. What damn stupid fool son of a bitch fired that gun? He roared. An indignant sergeant stood up. Why? He asked. That was an enemy plane. Our orders are to shoot at enemy planes, not to make them welcome. We had to restrain the pilot. White with anger, he might have tried to kill the sergeant. The army unit's lieutenant heard the shouting and came running up. When the full story unfolded, he bowed deeply and could only state, 
I do not know how to apologize for my men's stupidity. For the next several days, we cursed the army and bemoaned the loss of the enemy bomber. Today, of course, the incident provokes humor, but not in 1942, when the Flying Fortress was the most formidable opponent among all the Allied planes. As the week passed, tension between the Navy pilots and the Army garrison increased acutely. We did no combat flying during this period, and our tempers grew short. The unhappy situation exploded one night when, lying on my cot, I forgot the blackout and lit a cigarette. Immediately a voice called from outside. Cut out that smoking in there, you stupid bastard. Don't you even know what the regulations are? The pilot next to me, NAP 3C Honda, jumped to his feet and dashed out the door. In an instant, he had grabbed the soldier by the throat and was cursing him soundly. Honda, my wingman, was always too quick to take offence at any slight to me. I ran after him, but I was too late. Honda lost all control and before I could reach him, there was the sound of a fist against flesh, and then a thud, as the soldier fell unconscious to the ground. Honda raged. He ran from the billet and stood on the grass, shouting as loudly as he could. Come on, you army bastards! Here I am, Honda of the Navy! Come on out and fight, morons! Two soldiers rushed from their barracks and jumped Honda. I saw him grin as he spun about, and with a shout of glee leaped upon the army men. There was a brisk scuffle, the sound of blows struck quickly, and Honda rose to his feet, standing triumphantly over two more prostrate forms. Honda, stop it, I called, but without effect. More soldiers came running out and Honda happily turned to do battle. But the army lieutenant was hard on the heels of his own men, and herded them back to their own area. He said not a word to us, but we could hear him cursing out his troops. You are here to fight the enemy. Idiot swine, he spat. Not our own countrymen. And if you must fight, pick a quarrel with someone you can finish. Those pilots, every one of them is a samurai, and they like nothing better than to fight. The following morning, the lieutenant entered our club, and we braced ourselves for the expected complaints for our behavior. Instead, he smiled and said, Gentlemen, I am happy to bring you the news that another army contingent at Bandung in Java has captured a B-17 bomber intact and flyable. A loud cheer went up. A B-17 we could fly. The lieutenant waved his hands for silence. Unfortunately, Tokyo has ordered the bomber sent to Japan at once. I did not receive news of the capture until the B-17 took off for the home islands this morning. Disappointed voices and curses met this last report. However, the lieutenant added hastily. I assure you I will try to obtain as much information as possible about the captured aircraft for you. He saluted and left the room quickly. We despaired of ever getting a single scrap of information concerning the captured B-17. As far as the army and navy were concerned, the left hand never knew what the right hand was doing at any moment. Another week went by and we were still grounded. Even the peaceful atmosphere of Bali began to grate on our nerves. Perhaps under other circumstances, we could have enjoyed the inactivity, but we had come here to fight. For years, I had done nothing but learn how to fight, and all I and the other pilots wanted to do was to get back into the air. Then one morning, a pilot rushed breathlessly into our billet with startling news. Rotation. That was the rumor, and it appeared as if some of us would be sent back to Japan. Everyone began to total up his overseas time. I felt that, of all the men to be sent home, I would be the first to leave. I had left Japan for China in May of 1938 and, deducting my one year of recuperation after being wounded, had been overseas for 35 months. When I realized I might actually see my home again, I became acutely homesick. I spent all afternoon reading through the letters from Fujiko and my mother. They had written me at great length about the elaborate celebrations at home when Singapore fell in February, and of the many other festivities which our continued victories occasioned. All Japan was flushed with the sensational conquests of our forces, especially in the air. I yearned to again look at Fujiko, the most beautiful girl I had ever known. Only once had I gazed at her, and the thought that possibly, or even probably, she would become my bride, made me burst with happiness. 
Unlike most rumours, the news of rotation turned out to be true. On the 12th of March, Lieutenant Commander Tadashi Nakajima arrived from Japan and informed the squadron that he was relieving Lieutenant S.G. Eijo Shingo as squadron commander. Lieutenant Shingo is relieved for rotation, he said. I will now read off the names of those pilots ordered to return to Japan. Not a sound interrupted Nakajima's voice as he began reading down the list of pilots' names. The first man was not, as I had hoped, myself. Neither was the second, nor the third. I listened with disbelief as the commander ran through the list of more than seventy names, none of which was mine. I was baffled and hurt. I could not understand why I had been dropped from the list of pilots who were to return to Japan, and I had been overseas longer than most. Later, I approached the new commander and asked, Sir, I understand that my name was not among those of the pilots to be sent home. Would you be kind enough to tell me of the reason? I do not believe I... Commander Nakajima interrupted me by waving his hands in the air and grinning. No, you do not go home with the other men. I need you, Sakai, to go with me. We are advancing to a new air base, the foremost post against the enemy. We shall move to Rabal at New Britain. So far as I am concerned, you are the best pilot in this squadron and you will fly with me. Let these other men go home to defend the homeland. And that was that. The conversation was ended. Under our Navy system, I dared not even question the commander further. I returned to my billet, upset, miserable with the world, and despairing of ever seeing Fujiko and my family. I did not learn until many months later that Commander Nakajima's preference for me as one of his pilots in reality saved my life. Those pilots who returned home transferred later to the Midway Task Force, which suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of the enemy navy on June 5th. Almost all those men who left Bali were killed. The next several weeks were among the worst I have ever spent. Never have I suffered so much illness, dejection, and despondency crowded into such a brief period of time. Our next destination, Rabul, was 2,500 miles east of Bali, too great a distance for the Zero fighter to fly. Instead of transferring our group of pilots by transport plane or flying boat, or even on a fast warship, we were horrified to find ourselves herded like cattle into a small, old and decrepit merchant freighter. More than 80 of us were jammed into the stinking vessel, which crawled sluggishly through the water at 12 knots. For protection we were given only one small, 1,000-ton subchaser. Never have I felt so naked or exposed to the enemy as I did on that horrible vessel. We could not understand the workings of the High Command's mind. Just one torpedo from a lurking submarine, one 500 laybines, bomb from a diving bomber, and the thin-skinned freighter would blow into a thousand pieces. It was inconceivable, but true, that our commanders would risk half of the theatre's fighter pilots, especially those with the most experience, in such a seagoing monstrosity. Discontented and unhappy, I finally succumbed to my low spirits and became really ill. I was confined to my bunk in the hold of the ship for most of the two-week voyage from Bali to Rabol. The ship creaked and groaned incessantly as it wallowed along in its zigzag pattern. Every time we passed the wash of the escorting subchaser we heeled over, rolling drunkenly. Inside the vessel conditions were torturous. The heat was almost unbearable. I did not spend a single dry day during the entire two weeks. Sweat poured from our bodies in the humid and sultry holds. The smell of paint was gagging, and every single pilot in my hold became violently ill. After passing Timor Island, already occupied by our troops, the lone naval escort turned and disappeared rapidly in the distance. By now, I was seriously ill. At times I felt I was dying, and I believe I would have welcomed the release from my engulfing misery. But even the worst of experiences can have its rewards. At my side for most of the trip was a young lieutenant, recently assigned to lead my flight in combat. Lieutenant J.G. Junichi Sasai, was one of the most impressive men I have ever met. A graduate of the Japanese Naval Academy, he should have remained aloof from the problems of the non-commissioned officers. So strict was the Navy caste system that, even had we been dying in the holds, he would not have been required, indeed, would not have been expected to enter those stinking quarters. 
Sasai, however, was different. He paid no attention to the unwritten law that officers did not make friends with enlisted men. While in delirium I groaned and cried, lying in the reek of sweat and body odours, Sasai sat beside my cot, anxiously tending me as best he could. Every now and then I opened my eyes to gaze into his, clear and compassionate. His friendliness and ministrations pulled me through the worst of the voyage. At last the ship chugged its way into Rabal Harbour, the main port of New Britain. With a gasp of relief, I staggered from below decks to the pier. I could not believe what I saw. If Bali had been a paradise, then Rabal was plucked from the very depths of hell itself. There was a narrow and dusty airstrip which was to serve our group. It was the worst airfield I had ever seen anywhere. Immediately behind this wretched runway, a ghastly volcano loomed 700 feet into the air. Every few minutes the ground trembled and the volcano groaned deeply, then hurled out stones and thick, choking smoke. Behind the volcano stood pallid mountains, stripped of all their trees and foliage. As soon as we were off the ship, the pilots were taken to the airstrip. The dusty road over which we travelled was inches deep in pumice and bitter volcanic ash. The airstrip was desolate and forbidding. Dust and ashes rose into the air directly behind us. Mutters of despair rose from the pilots when they found among the parked fighters several of the long obsolete, open cockpit, fixed landing gear, clawed fighters. It was all too much for me. I became ill again and collapsed. Lieutenant Sasai rushed me to the half completed hospital on a hill bordering the airstrip. <laughs> Through the window, I saw a dozen marauders, twin-engined bombers, streaking low over the harbour and expertly pouring bombs into the Kamaki Mam, the ship which had brought us here from Bali. Her crew, unloading cargo when the B-26 bombers struck, scattered across the pier and dove into the water. In a few moments, the burning and gutted ship was sinking. The bombers, all bearing Australian markings, then worked over the runway and the planes parked there. For three successive days, the marauders returned to blast the field and anything which moved. They cruised slowly at low altitude, their gunners enjoying a field day of strafing. No man was safe above the ground, for he was sure to draw the fire of several heavy machine guns. The attacks were the best possible tonic for me. At least Rabaul promised action to jerk me out of the stupor into which I had sunk from so many weeks of being grounded. I begged the doctor to discharge me from the hospital at once. I fairly itched to get my hands at the controls of a zero again. The doctor laughed. You stay here, Sakai, for another few days. There's no use letting you out now. We haven't any fighters for you to fly. When our planes come in, I'll let you go. Four days later, greatly improved, I left the hospital. With 19 other fighter pilots, I climbed into a four-engined flying boat which had arrived only that morning. We were soon to be flying again, for the seaplane was from the converted carrier Kasuga, which had brought 20 new Zero fighter planes for our squadron. Constant enemy reconnaissance and bombing prevented the Kasuga from entering Rabul, and she waited near Buka Island, 200 miles away, for the seaplane to transport us there. Two hours later we were back at Rabul, grinning like schoolchildren with our twenty new fighters, all armed and ready for combat. That same day, however, a reconnaissance plane saw our fighters on the ground and disappeared before we could take off. Rabal became quiet, except for the volcanic eruptions which continued unabated. For the next several weeks, there was a constant flow of fighters and bombers into Rabal. We rapidly accumulated new strength for the growing offensive to be directed against Australia and Port Moresby in New Guinea. We were told that Japanese plans called for the complete occupation of New Guinea. Early in April, 30 of us from the Tainan Wing transferred to a new airbase at Leh on the eastern coast of New Guinea. Captain Masahisa Saito led our group to the new installation, then began some of the fiercest air battles of the entire Pacific War. Only 180 miles away from the Allied bastion of Port Moresby, we began our new assignments by flying escort almost daily for our bombers, which flew from Rabal to hammer the enemy installations in the critical Moresby area. No longer was the war entirely one-sided. As often as we lashed out at Moresby, Allied fighters and bombers came to attack Leh. 
The valour of the Allied pilots and their willingness to fight surprised us all. Whenever they attacked Ley, they were invariably intercepted, and several of their planes were damaged or shot down. Our attacks on Moresby also contributed to the Allied losses. The willingness of the Allied pilots to engage us in combat deserves special mention here. For, regardless of the odds, their fighters were always screaming in to attack. And it is important to point out that their fighter planes were clearly inferior in performance to our own Zeros. Furthermore, almost all of our pilots were skilled air veterans. Coupled with the Zeros' outstanding performance, this afforded us a distinct advantage. The men we fought then were among the bravest I have ever encountered, no less so than our own pilots who, three years later, went out willingly on missions from which there was no hope of return. Chapter 12 On April 8th, I flew with eight other pilots from Rabul to our new base on Ley. I groaned when I circled the field. Where were the hangars, the maintenance shops, the control tower? Where was anything but a dirty, small runway? I felt as though I were landing on a carrier deck. On three sides of the runway, there towered the rugged mountains of the Papuan Peninsula. The fourth side, from which I approached, was bordered by the ocean. Twenty-one other pilots, who had preceded us by several days, awaited us at the end of the runway as we taxied off the strip. Honda and Yonakawa, my wingmen in the Java Theater, were the first to greet me. Welcome home, Sakai, Honda shouted, grinning. The world's most wonderful place greets you, I looked at Honda. As usual, he was joking, although I could find little cause for humor in this forsaken mud hole. The runway was 3,000 feet long at the most, and ran at a right angle from the mountain slope, almost down to the water. Adjacent to the beach was a small aircraft hangar, riddled with shrapnel and bullet holes. Three shattered Australian transport planes lay in a tangled heap on the floor, and demolished equipment littered the area. The hangar and its contents had been bombed and strafed by our planes during landing operations the previous month. The Ley Airdrome had been hacked out by the Australians to airlift supplies and gold ore to and from the Kokoda Mine, which lay deep within the formidable Owen Stanley Mountains. Overland access to the mine was almost impossible, since thick, steaming jungles and precipitous mountain slopes barred the way to foot travel. The seaport was as desolate as the airfield. A single merchant ship of 500 tons, also Australian, lay in the harbour mud, its stern and a mast jutting from the water near the primitive pier. And that was the only vessel in sight. I was convinced that Ley was the worst airfield I had ever seen, not excluding Rabaul or even the advanced fields in China. However, nothing could dampen Honda's spirits. I tell you, Saburo, he insisted, you have come to the best hunting grounds on the earth. Don't let this field or the jungle fool you. We have never had better opportunities to bag game than we have here. He was still grinning. Honda was serious. He liked being here. He went on to explain that the isolated airbase had seen brisk action for three consecutive days before my arrival. On April 5th, four Zeros from Ley escorting seven bombers raided Port Moresby and shot down two enemy fighters with the loss of a Zero. On the next day, the same number of planes went out, and the fighter pilots came home jubilantly with claims for five enemy planes shot down. Yesterday, the seventh, two Zeros, intercepted three enemy bombers over Salamawa, and in a running fight, shot down two, in addition to one probable. The enemy gunners took one zero with them. To Honda, action was the most important thing in life. He was indifferent to the pest hole from which we flew. That was unimportant. That afternoon, we assembled for briefing in the airfield command post. I use the words command post freely. The CP was ridiculously inadequate. It failed to deserve even the name Shack, for it had no walls. Mats hung from flimsy overhead beams to serve as walls, curtains, and doors. The room was barely large enough to hold all 30 flyers when they huddled closely together. In the center was a large, crude table, hewn from local timber. A few candles and one kerosene lamp served for illumination. Our electricity for telephones came from batteries. After we had been briefed by Captain Saito, we went to our billets. 
Outside the CP, I saw all the vehicles assigned to lay. These consisted of an ancient, rusty, creaky Ford sedan, one decrepit truck, and one fueling vehicle. They served the entire base. There were no hangars. We lacked even a control tower. However, my obvious disappointment at Lei failed to dampen the spirits of Honda and Yonakawa. Honda grabbed my duffel bag and sang gaily as we walked to the billets. On the way, Yonakawa pointed out the base facilities. Two hundred sailors manned flak positions beyond the airstrip. They provided the entire combat garrison. These two hundred men, plus one hundred maintenance personnel and the thirty pilots, comprised the entire Japanese strength at Lei. During our stay, and until Lei's capture by the Allies in 1943, no attempt was made to improve our facilities, nor were any ground reinforcements brought in. Twenty non-commissioned officers and three enlisted flyers were packed into a single shack. This so-called building was six by ten yards. In its center there rested a large table, which we used alternately for eating, for writing, and for reading. On both sides of the room, cots were jammed together. A handful of candles provided our only light. The billet was a typical tropical hut with a floor raised five feet off the damp ground. A rickety staircase at its front provided entry to our home. A big water tank lay behind the billet. The men cut an empty fuel drum open and shaped it into an impromptu bathtub. It was an unwritten law that every other night each man would bathe. Other fuel drums were cut open and bent into different shapes for use as cooking facilities and wash basins. One orderly attended the kitchen. He was a harried man, for the task of providing 69 meals a day alone kept him busy. But despite the intense combat of later weeks, every man took special pains to wash out all his underclothes in the basins every day. We might be living in a pest hole, but no man wished his own body to become filthy. Near the row of drums, the men had dug a crude dugout for an air raid shelter. When the enemy bombers came, flying swiftly and low over the trees in surprise attacks, the dugouts were filled in amazingly short time by men leaping from the billets, bath, or latrine. We were quartered some 500 yards east of the airstrip and walked or ran to the runway to reach our planes. The luxury of motorized transportation appeared only when we had orders to scramble. Then the Ford snorted its way down to pick us up, 500 yards northeast of the strip lay the officers' quarters. Their billet was exactly the same as ours. Their only advantage was that ten officers comprised their total strength. They had the same facilities for half the number of men. The base commander, his deputy, and an assistant crowded into a smaller shack adjoining the officers' billet. Yeah. Our daily schedule for the four months following our arrival settled into an almost unvarying routine. At 2.30 a.m., the maintenance crews were aroused from their sleep to prepare our fighters. One hour later, the orderlies woke all the pilots. Breakfast was taken either at the billet or occasionally around the command post. Our menu was monotonous and unvarying. A dish of rice, soybean paste soup with dried vegetables, and pickles comprised breakfast. For the first month, the rice was mixed with an unsavory barley to stretch out our supplies. After four weeks of steady combat, however, the barley was stopped. At its best, our chow at Lei was pitifully inadequate. Following breakfast, six pilots waited by their planes, their fighters warmed up and ready for takeoff. These were to be scrambled for interception, and they stood at the end of the runway, poised for immediate flight. We never flew scout missions at Lei, and radar was something unknown. But the six fighters could be moving in seconds. Those pilots not scheduled for the scramble flight waited around the CP for orders. With little to discuss except aerial tactics, we resorted to chess and checkers to pass the time. At eight in the morning, a formation of zeros went aloft for patrol. On a fighter sortie, they took the shortest route for the enemy area, down Moresby Alley. If the mission was bomber escort, we flew southeastward along the Papuan coastline and joined the bombers over the usual rendezvous of Buna. Usually, we were back at Lay by noon for lunch. It was hardly anything to come home for. The meals were unchanging and exactly the same fare we would have for supper. Lunch consisted of bowls of steaming rice and canned fish or meat. The officers were only slightly better off. Their rations were the same, 
but the five orderlies assigned to them took special pains to disguise the food as different dishes. Between the regular three meals, all pilots were fed fruit juice and various types of candy. To compensate for the deficiency of vitamins and calories in our regular meals. About five o'clock each evening, all the pilots assembled for daily gymnastics, a required athletic course designed to keep our bodies agile and our reflexes sharp. After the group training, all men off emergency standby returned to their billets for supper and bathing, and spent two or three hours reading or writing letters home. By eight or nine, we were in bed. Our recreation was all improvised. The pilots often took out their guitars, ukuleles, accordions, or harmonicas, and joined together to play our national songs. While the Rabal base hired many natives to work as coolies, our own force at Ley had no natives to do our work. The nearest village was two miles away, and no coaxing or coercion could force the inhabitants to expose themselves to the attacks which came almost daily. They were terrified by the roaring plains, the machine guns, and the shattering thunder of bombs. So this was Ley. The chow was poor, the daily schedule harsh and unchanging. We had no post exchange or any other recreation facilities. Women. At Ley, everyone asked, What are those? Yet, our morale was high. Certainly we lacked the physical comforts, and even some of the so-called necessities, of everyday life, but this was little cause for complaint. We were here not to have our personal requirements met, but to fight. We wanted to fight. What were we fighter pilots for, except to engage enemy planes in combat? At Bali, with a paradise at our disposal, the men bitched unceasingly. At Bali, we had been grounded, and clipping the wings of our group was the worst possible punishment. It must be remembered that the pilot's garrison at Ley was unlike those of other air bases. Every one of us was handpicked from our air force. At Ley, our officers had collected the men whose only desire was to be squeezing the gun trigger in a zero while riding an enemy fighter's tail. On April 11th, I was back in combat. It was a most auspicious return for on that day I scored my first double play. The prospect of returning to combat after nearly two months of enforced idleness excited me. The day before, April 10th, I was not scheduled to fly and had to remain on the ground while the other pilots enjoyed a field day. Six of our fighters escorted seven bombers to Moresby, shot down two enemy bombers caught trying to flee the enemy field and probably shot down a third. Later the same day, three standby Zeros scrambled from the Ley runway to make a timely interception of several enemy bombers over Salamawa. Of the latter, one was shot down and the others damaged. Our flight on the 11th was more of a familiarization mission. With eight other new arrivals to Ley, we took off and formed into three Vs, flying toward Moresby. During the run along the coastline, we pulled steadily for altitude. The weather was perfect, and the white sandy beach looked like a mass of bleached bones ground up and scattered along the edge of the island. Then the Owen Stanley Range towered in front of us, jutting 15,000 feet above the ocean. Despite their extreme height, no snow capped their peaks, and the slopes resembled vast walls of fearsome jungle. At 16,500 feet, we crossed the mountain ridgeline, and abruptly, we were in a new world, the enemies. I failed to sight even a single ship on the vast, deep blue surface of the Coral Sea. The water was an incredible indigo marble sheet, stretching as far as the eye could see. The mountains before us sloped down to the southern coast, in a decline more gradual than their drop to our airstrip. Otherwise, it was all the same. Forty-five minutes after takeoff, the Moresby base slipped beneath my wings. I could see a large number of planes of different types on the ground. Many were being rushed from their exposed positions on the field to jungle revetments hidden from the air by the thick foliage surrounding the enemy strip. The anti-aircraft guns remained silent. Perhaps we were above their effective range. It seemed to be a perfect setup for a strafing attack. We could hit the planes on the ground long before they could be in their revetments and safe from our guns. But the orders were for a familiarization flight air combat only, and no strafing. We passed Moresby and turned out to the Coral Sea. 
After a while, we retraced our former course, again passing over the enemy base. We were amazed that the enemy gunners and pilots seemed to ignore our presence and offered no resistance. We passed over the airfield, this time with the sun directly behind us, cruising slowly when we finally sighted the enemy's planes. Four P-39s, the first Aracobras I had ever seen. They were flying almost directly at us, some three miles off and to our left. It was impossible to tell yet whether or not we had been sighted. I jettisoned my fuel tank and poured power to the engine, my two wingmen right with me. I pulled alongside our lead fighter and signalled my discovery to Lieutenant Sasai, requesting cover for our attack. He waved his hand forward. Go ahead, we'll cover you. Not a move from the four Aracobras yet. We were in luck. With the blinding sun directly before them, the American pilots failed to pick out our approaching fighters. The P-39s flew in two pairs, the first two planes preceding the others by about 300 yards. I moved Honda behind and above me and signalled the less experienced Jonakawa to follow directly behind my fighter. Then we were only 500 yards from the enemy planes, heeling over to the left. In a few seconds, we would be ready to strike. If only they continued to be blinded by the sun, we could hit them before they even knew we were in the air. Even as I was ready to roll over for the attack, I changed my approach. If I pulled up to come in from a dive, I would lose the advantage of having the sun behind me. Instead, I shoved the stick forward and dove, Honda and Yonakawa sticking to me like glue. We went down and then came around in a sharp, fast turn, in perfect position. The last two fighters were now above and ahead of me, unaware of our approach. They were still blinded, and we closed the distance steadily, waiting until it would be impossible to miss the target. The two P-39s were almost wing to wing, and at 50 yards they were clear in my rangefinder. Now. I jammed down on the cannon button, and in a second, the first Ira Cobra was done for. The shells converged in the center of the fuselage. Pieces of metal broke off and flipped away. A fountain of smoke and flame belched outward. I skidded and brought the guns to bear on the second P-39. Again, the shells went directly home, exploding inside and tearing the fighter into bits. Both Aero Cobras plummeted out of control. I brought the Zero out of its skid and swung up in a tight turn, prepared to come out directly behind the two lead fighters. The battle was already over. Both P-39s were plunging crazily toward the earth, trailing bright flames and thick smoke. They had been shot down as quickly as the two I had caught so unawares. I recognized one of the Zeros still pulling out from its diving pass, Hiroyoshi Nishizawa, a rookie pilot at the controls. The second Zero, which had made a kill with a single firing pass, piloted by Toshio Ota, hauled around in a steep pullout to rejoin the formation. It was incredible that in less than five seconds, the fight was over, and four enemy fighters were smashing on the surface far below. It was remarkable that two of the kills were registered by Nishizawa, 23 years old, and Ota, only 22. A word of explanation is proper here. As stated before, all the pilots at Lei were handpicked. Foremost among the reasons for their selection was their flying aptitude. Both these two young pilots stood out, even among the men with whom we flew. Many of us were combat veterans, and the newcomers were especially quick to learn. Nishizawa and Ota proved to be brilliant at the controls. They went on to become, with myself, the leading aces of the Lai Wing. Often we flew together, and were known to the other pilots as the clean-up trio. I can think of Nishizawa and Ota only as pilots of genius. They did not fly their airplanes, they became a part of the Zero, welded into the fiber of the fighter, an automaton which functioned, it seemed, as a machine capable of intelligent thought. They were among the greatest of all Japanese flyers. Both men were devoted solely to their roles as fighter pilots. Everything was subordinated to their fighting function. Their skill made them particularly dangerous opponents, even against a fighter airplane of superior performance, such as we were to encounter later in the war. Their prowess enabled them individually to invite attack by several enemy planes and still emerge victorious. 
Hiroyoshi Nishizawa became Japan's greatest fighter ace. He did not look the part. Indeed, one had only to look at Nishizawa to feel sorry for him. One felt the man should be in a hospital bed. He was tall and lanky for a Japanese, nearly five feet eight inches in height. He had a gaunt look about him. He weighed only 140 pounds, and his ribs protruded sharply through his skin. Nishizawa suffered almost constantly from malaria and tropical skin diseases. He was pale most of the time. <laughs> if there is such an expression, Nishizawa was all pilot. He lived and breathed only to fly, and he flew for two things. The joy which comes with the ownership of that strange and wonderful world in the sky, and to fight. Once he had taken wing, this strange and phlegmatic man underwent a startling transformation. His reserve, his silence, his spurning of his associates vanished almost as quickly as the darkness vanishes before dawn. To all who flew with him, he became the devil. He was unpredictable in the air, a genius, a poet who seemed to make his fighter respond obediently to his gentle, sure touch at the controls. Never have I seen a man with a fighter plane do what Nishizawa would do with his zero. His aerobatics were all at once breathtaking, brilliant, totally unpredictable, impossible, and heart-stirring to witness. He was a bird, yet he could fly in such a way as no bird could imitate. Even his eyesight was unusual. Where we could see only sky, Nishizawa, with almost supernatural vision, could catch the specks of enemy planes still invisible to us. Never in his long and brilliant career as a warrior of the skies was this man caught unaware by the enemy. He fulfilled, truly, his title of devil. Only he was a devil of the blue and the clouds, a man so gifted as to make us all, even myself, envious of his genius in the air. Toshio Ota was exactly the opposite. A brilliant youngster, Ota was amiable and friendly, willing to join in the fun and festivities of the group, quick to laugh at our jokes, instantly at the side of a fellow pilot in need of help, either in the air or on the ground. He was taller and heavier than I was, and, like Nishizawa, was inexperienced in combat on his arrival at Lai. Despite his amiability and stark contrast to Nishizawa, his talent at his controls was quickly recognized, and Otter flew always as cover wingman for the squadron commander's own fighter. Otter was hardly the typical hero type. He was too quick to grin and laugh, too quick to be friendly. The aura of hero worship could not be attached to this smiling young man, who appeared more at home, I am sure, in a nightclub, than in the forsaken loneliness of Lei. Yet this intimacy with his friends in no way detracted from the great respect which his flying skill inspired. Even the rough and ready men like Honda held him in high regard, although Honda, as well as Yonakawa, feared and shunned the devil.